This video is an introduction to the power rule, which is the method for taking the derivative of x to the n. Now in this video, we're going to prove the power rule when n is a natural number. We'll find out that the power rule works for any real number exponent, but this video will focus just on the case when n is a natural number. So this is our fundamental question. n is 1, 2, 3, any of the natural numbers, and our, and our question is what is the derivative of x to the n? Or in Lagrange notation, if f of x equals x to the n, then what is f prime of x? Applying our definition of derivative, we would look at this limit as h goes to 0. Substituting in the formula for f in this case, we'd be trying to evaluate this limit. Now, it's pretty clear that the most troublesome part of this whole calculation is going to be to figure out what x plus h to the n really is. So to answer this question properly, let's talk a little bit about Pascal's triangle and binomial expansions. We'll start with a triangular configuration, and we will fill in some numbers. And the rules for filling in these numbers are really quite easy. We will fill in ones along the edges of the triangle. And now, for each of the internal entries, we'll simply add up the neighbors above. So 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 1 is 3, and so on. And by doing this repeatedly, you can fill in the entries of this triangle. And you can keep on going through the bottom of this diagram as many rows as you want. This configuration is known as Pascal's triangle after the French mathematician Blaise Pascal. Although he didn't invent the triangle, he studied it and his name has been attached to it, but ancient mathematicians knew about this long before Pascal. Why Pascal's triangle is important for us is in its role in helping to expand binomials. So let's take a look at a simple case. x plus y squared is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. And we're going to notice that if you take this row out of Pascal's triangle, the coefficients match the number of each type of term. So there's one of the x squareds, there are two of the xy's, and there's one of the y squareds. If you look at x plus y cubed, you'll notice the same pattern for the next row. So there's one of these terms, three of these, three of these, and one of these. The pattern even works at the top of the triangle. So x plus y to the 0 is 1. So that coefficient we can interpret as the entry there. And x plus y to the first power is just x plus y. And there's one each of the x and y terms. So let's come up with a useful way of referring to each row. If we start our counting at 0, so the top row is row 0, then we will be able to claim that row n unlocks x plus y to the n. Let's look at an example. Suppose we want to expand x plus y to the fourth. We should move to row 4. And the claim is that row 4 unlocks x plus y to the fourth. There's another part of the pattern, which is the powers of x and y that show up. So what does this power look like? We're going to have decreasing powers of x. And we'll start with the highest power, x to the fourth, and we'll go down to the zeroth power. Meanwhile, there should be increasing powers of y. Please notice that for each term, the sum of the exponents adds up to 4 which is the overall power that we're trying to expand. Here are the entries from row 4 of Pascal's triangle. And they tell us how many of each of these terms we should have. Of course, we aren't going to write many of these terms the way they look right here. The first term, for example, we would just call x to the fourth. The last term we would just call y to the fourth, and so on. Cleaning this up we find that x plus y to the fourth is equal to this expression. And in fact, you can work this out the long way and find out that this is true. We aren't going to prove here why Pascal's triangle works the way it does to help you expand powers of binomials, but it does work. And it's very useful when you want to expand, say, cubes or fourth powers or even sixth or seventh powers of binomials when the terms are reasonable. It's, it's a very nice practical tool to have in your toolbox. And we need it now because we're going to use it in our analysis of the derivative of x to the n. 
Let's first look at a specific example. Let's look at the derivative of x to the fifth. We need to evaluate this limit of secant slopes as h goes to zero. And in order to do that, we need to expand x plus h to the fifth. So we'll need the entries in row five of Pascal's triangle. We write out our powers of x to the fifth and h, noticing that the exponents in each term add up to five. Insert our coefficients. And there we have our expression for x plus h to the fifth. Now we'll just work from here. We'll subtract off x to the fifth from both sides, yielding this equation. We will factor out the common h that appears everywhere on the right side. And now we'll divide both sides by h. A little cancellation gives us this simplified version of the right-hand side of the equation. And now we're going to factor another power of h here. And here's an observation that's going to turn out to be useful. This expression is polynomial in h. Once we've fixed an argument x, we'll get some coefficients. We don't know what they are until we fix x, but we'll notice that what's left is just a cubic polynomial in h. So let's abstract out this notion. We could just call this p of h. So here's what the secant slope looks like. And now we need to take the limit of this secant slope as h approaches 0. We can use the sum rule for limits and the product rule for limits to get this expression. This first term is just a constant. Remember, x is fixed throughout this process of looking at the limit as h goes to 0. This limit is, of course, 0. And because a polynomial is continuous, this limit is simply p of 0. Now, you could ask the question, well, what is p of 0? And in fact, if you looked at the previous slide, you'd find out that p of 0 is actually 10x cubed. But it's really irrelevant, because this expression will wind up being 0 times p of 0. So the value of p of 0 really doesn't matter. You know that this term is going to wind up being 0. And the total limit is 5x to the fourth. This was our definition of derivative. And we've discovered that the derivative is 5x to the fourth. How does this result fit in other known results? So here are the various derivatives we've seen so far. So an obvious gap here is the derivative of x to the fourth. And if you can't see the pattern already, we could rewrite 2x as 2x to the first and 1 as 1x to the 0. And then the pattern becomes pretty clear. The missing coefficient here is 4, and the missing exponent is 3. So if this apparent pattern is true, then we expect the derivative of x to the fourth to be 4x cubed. And in fact, we could wager that the derivative of x to the n generally should be nx to the n minus 1. So how could we prove this? Let's try to emulate the calculation for x to the fifth as much as possible. So we want to expand x plus h to the n. We don't know what n is, but we do know we need row n. And one of the things we observe is that the first entry has to be 1, and the second entry has to be n itself. And this is going to be critical information for us. Now, there are other entries, but they wind up not being as important. So let's put in our pattern. And we'll notice that we have to leave out some terms, because we don't know what n is. But the powers of x decrease, and the powers of h increase. The coefficients for our expansion come from row n. So there's just one of these. There are n of these. And now we have a whole bunch of other terms. We don't know what the coefficients are, but that's not going to be so important. We're going to notice that there are at least two powers of h in each term. So what we'll do is we will factor out the h squared that's common to each of those terms. And that leaves a big old blob that we don't know much about except that it is a polynomial in h. So we can write x plus h to the n as x to the n plus n x to the n minus 1 times h plus h squared times p of h. Let's subtract off x to the n from both sides and factor out the common h and divide by h to obtain this expression for the secant slope. And now we need to look at the limit as h approaches 0. We have the sum and product laws for limits. This is the limit of a constant, so it's just nx to the n minus 1. 
this limit is zero, and this limit is p of zero. So that term winds up being just zero. Here's our definition of the derivative of x to the n. In the end, it wound up being nx to the n minus one. So our conjecture was correct. The power rule states that the derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus one. It's important to realize that this proof applies only when n is a natural number. However, the power rule does work when n is any real number. We just don't have a proof for it yet. So let's test drive this power rule. What's the derivative of x to the fourth? 4x cubed. x to the fifth, just like we saw, 5x to the fourth. x to the 51, no problem, 51x to the 50. And more generally, the derivative of x to the p, if we don't know what p is, that's okay, we can still apply the power rule. The derivative should be px to the p minus 1.